On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 1968. We're going to be taking a look at Sly and the Family Stone, and they're going to be performing Everyday People leading into Dance to the Music. Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. So let's get Sly and the guys and girls up on screen and see how they get on. Don't hate the black, don't hate the white. If you get bitten, just hate the bite. I'm just going to jump in here. As always, the link to this video is going to be in the description below, so you can check it out there without me interrupting it. And just as Sly and Rose run off into the crowd, it is going to be something we're going to look at when we resume it. And it shows the showmanship side to the band, but also the overwhelming theme of inclusion and everybody being the same and especially everyday people. Obviously, we don't have the whole song here, just the intro where they do start playing everyday people. But that was a song that made the whole expression, different strokes for different folks, a common expression because it's just saying about how many different people there are in the world and that we're all the same. We're all everyday people. And unfortunately, it's something that is still relevant today, if not the most relevant ever in certainly my generation. So getting into the analysis of this live sound that we're getting, We've got this luxury within Sly and the Family Stone of multiple vocalists, and not only that, but multiple great vocalists. And this is also the advantage of having male vocals, female vocals, because you get such a wide range that can be covered, and we certainly get that in this song. And Sly, just himself, has such a wide range vocally I'm sure you guys have heard other performances by Sly when he takes his range right down there. But as an example of belting here in the intro, straight off the bat, he's hitting a B4, and that is just one note below the C5. And the C5 is that holy grail for male tenors having such range, and he is belting this in chest voice as well. We also have Cynthia Robertson, who right at the beginning of Dance to the Music belts that out and says, get up, dance to the music. 
And when we get into the track, there are so many things that start kicking off. We've got that groove in there immediately, but another thing to mention about Sly playing the electric organ, the fact that he started out playing the guitar and then his brother Freddie, who then resumes the vocal duties, he plays the guitar. So then Sly moved over to the electric organ, learned how to play that from scratch. So it's something that he took on himself in order to get that full band sound, just started to learn a new instrument and Sly being a multi-instrumentalist, he was one of those guys that could get down a whole album in the studio by himself. So something to look out for here that really does drive the rhythm along within this performance and the composition is that tambourine. And this is something that Jerry Martini is multitasking between tambourine and saxophone. So it means that Whenever there is a saxophone line, of course, Jerry needs his other hand. So he does away with the tambourine, plays the line on the saxophone, and then goes back to the tambourine. So you'll hear it dropping out here or there. But by the time everything's got moving and the drums kick in, now the drums can take over what the tambourine was doing. And the drums, it's something to point out as well, the fact that we do have a snare being hit on every beat of the bar. Normally it's something you will hear on two and four of the bar. So we've got that rhythm driving forward with Greg Errico on drums here, striking that snare, like I said, on every beat of the bar. We've then got Larry Graham as well with his solid bass playing. And Larry is the guy that brought in slap bass. When I say brought it in, he was the first one to do it. And I've seen interviews with him where he talks through it. In fact, there is quite an entertaining video here on YouTube somewhere where Larry's being interviewed about the technique and he's playing bass the whole time that he's talking. And he was just saying about when he didn't play with a drummer, he wanted to try and get the effect of the foot pedal, but on his bass. So that's why he would strike the string with his thumb. And also he'd pop the octave with his first finger. And that would give the effect of the snare on the second beat of the bar. So he could jump between his thumb and then his first finger. But bringing in just that technique, it shows the amount of talent we've got across the board in this whole band, how revolutionary they were as well, because within this first First verse. We start, of course, with the intro, Sly laying down those vocals, hitting some crazy pitches, but also belting and chest voice great control. And then he passes over to Freddie, and this is Freddie Stone, with his great vocals playing and singing at the same time. We will get into the guitar chords in a second, but then the vocal passes to Larry. And you can see the change in range that we have between the singers, because Larry is then singing the octave below, and then we return to Sly to finish off the verse. So just to take you guys through the chords that are being played here by Freddie on the guitar, in the intro, when we get into everyday people, it's literally just a G into a C, and then back into the G again. And I'm using the bar chord positions down here on the third fret. And timing wise, you want to be changing to the C on four and. So we're going up one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. And as you would have noticed there, after you've done the four and, we then go and two is the next phrase. That's the way that it's timed. So we're going one and two and three and four and one and two, just like that. And then we're going to be into the start of Dance to the Music. And this is from what I can hear, just a G shape with a sus4 thrown in. So this is your first finger on the first fret of your B string, which is the C note. And then coming off, and that's the fill that's being thrown in there. And the rhythm for that, after the drum fill, we've just got one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. So you can see how I was just bringing on that first finger for the third and the fourth strum. One, two, three, four. And then after that, we get into a G seventh here. So now we've got our bar chord shape. If you want to have a pick through, that's our seventh. And we've got this. 
So giving you a guide of where those strums come in, we've got one and two and three and four. So that was one and two, and then some muted strumming, and four. One and two and three and four. And then we're just shifting up to a C seventh position. And that's gonna be on our eighth fret, and again, you wanna have your seventh in there. At least that's what it sounds like. Like I said, it does change here or there with the rhythm, but it does sound like we've got a seventh kind of feel to this progression. So we've got this. And an important thing to point out as well, if you are doing the full bar chords, you probably want to focus on the top end of the guitar because that's what Freddie's doing in this performance, just getting all of that high E string, B string, G string in there at the top of the guitar. Like that. We then have a little break from the horn section and we get into this riff that is in E flat and it goes like this. like that. And obviously the bass is the focus here with that riff. I'm just playing the notes that Larry's playing on the bass, but then when we get into the guitar that Freddie's playing, so we've got this. So just a couple of strums and then sliding down. So we've got this. Once we've been through that riff, we then transition into F. And now this is the key change that means we're going to continue from here on in with the rest of the song in F. So we have got quite a progression going on here that might fly under the radar, but it keeps it interesting the whole time. Exactly the same shape that we played before. I'm not sure if I explained it or not, but you have your second finger on your F here and then your first finger on the A. I'll just call out the strings rather than the notes. So second finger on the A string on the eighth fret. First finger is gonna be on the seventh fret of the D string. And then you wanna squash your third finger down across the high E, the B and the G so that we get those three strings ringing out. And when we add that all together, and rhythm wise, we've got this. Like that, so there's a definite upstroke in there. And in this part of the song as well, we then transition down to. So that was going to the B flat seventh and the A flat seventh as well. But let's get back into the performance and we'll watch it all the way to the end.
And there we have it. What a great live performance and what a multi-talented band because we have all of those vocals kicking off the whole time, singing in harmony with each other as well. But the showmanship of Sly and his sister Rose. So we've got this funky groove running the whole time. And also you can notice how drums wise with Greg, we then go to two and four with the snare just to keep it interesting. Again, changing it up from that snare coming in on every beat of the bar. Instrumentally, vocally, entertainment wise as well you get everything in this performance and it's just a great overall message just making it about the music and people that were getting into it when they went into the crowd you have that whole showmanship element but what I love about it is that it doesn't really matter if people join in or not because the band are having a great time more often than not, it is the case that when a band's having a great time and they're relaxed, enjoying themselves, that does filter through to the audience and the audience start getting into it as well and enjoy it at the same level because there isn't any barrier between the band and the audience, especially in this performance where Sly and Rose get out into the crowd. So they're bringing that crowd on stage with them. It's totally inclusive and it's just a great live performance from every single aspect. I do want to get briefly into the history. I know that this video has probably gone on for a while already, but the Stone family were religious and this is where they first started singing at church, of course, and they were encouraged to express themselves musically. And the youngest four in the family started the group, the Stuart Four, and Sly and Freddie were in student bands as well. And the Viscanes were the first band that Sly had. It was his high school band. It was in 1964 that Sly became known as Sly because he was Sylvester before that because he started DJing and he had a show where he played all kinds of music. It didn't matter if it was black artists or white artists. And he also had a band and Freddie, his brother, had a band independently. And this is when those two bands came together in order to be Sly and the Family Stone. For reference, this would have been around 1966 when the bands got together and then Sly started learning how to play the electric organ because he and Freddie both played guitar, like I mentioned earlier. Also, Vetstone joined in at this time because she said she wanted to be in the band with Mary McCreary and Elva Mooton, and they were known as Little Sisters, the backing group to Sly and the Family Stone. So they were spotted by CBS records and signed a deal with them and in 1967 is when they released a whole new thing and this album was critically acclaimed but unfortunately didn't sell well commercially and they played smaller venues and in 1968 released Dance to the Music and that's the song that we've just heard. It was a monster hit. It went to number eight in the charts and the album of the same name sold really well and they followed that up in 1968 with the album called Life. In late 1968, they released Everyday People and this got to number one in the charts. It was effectively a protest song against any and all kinds of prejudice and it was the lead single from their album called Stand and that was released in 1969 and that was a huge hit. It got to number 22 in the charts and went on to sell over 3 million copies and in 1969 they performed at Woodstock. They also had a massive hit with Hot Fun in the summertime and that got to number two in the charts, but unfortunately from the late 1960s entering into the 1970s, there were internal problems within the band and friction. There was also drug use going on and Sly was part of that. And during this time, the recording and the releases really slowed down because of the use of drugs. And Sly also brought in gangsters to be his bodyguards and also got some of his streetwise friends to act as management. And 
The main reason for that was in the dealings of drugs. So during this time as well, there were personal changes within the band, but they weren't really doing much. So due to the fact that the fan base were becoming impatient as nothing was being recorded or released, the record label released a greatest hits in 1970, and that did really well. It got to number two in the charts. But then in 1971, they released Family Affair, and that was a huge hit. It got to number one, and that was the lead single of the much-awaited album There's a Riot Going On. Something that people noticed on that album was the hiss, the tape hiss that you get from extensive overdubs. And that's what Sly did on that particular album to get it just right. He would do a lot of overdubs on the tape and the more you overwrite a bit of tape, obviously the more it is affected and worn down it gets and you start to get that hiss sound. So that's what happened with that album. But during this time as well, unfortunately, Sly and Larry's relationship really deteriorated to the point where a brawl broke out after a gig and then Larry had to climb out of a hotel window with his wife to escape. So obviously Larry quit the band at that point and he set up Graham Central Station. But the Sly and the Family Stone project still continued. In 1973, they released Fresh, and If You Want Me To Stay turned into a top 20 hit. And in 1974, Small Talk was released. Due to the fact that there was a lot of drug use going on during the 70s, they would miss gigs and band members wouldn't turn up. And in 1975, they booked themselves into the Radio City Music Hall and they only managed to fill that to one eighth of its capacity. So the band was dissolved at that point and Rose Stone then started her own solo career. Freddie joined in with Graham Central Station and Freddie would collaborate with his brother for the final time in 1970 with Back on the Right Track. And then Freddie actually retired after that. Sly did continue as a solo artist and, like I mentioned before, did use the Sly and the Family Stone band name, even though the band didn't exist anymore. He released material sporadically throughout the 1980s, and in 1987, unfortunately, he was arrested for possession of cocaine. He was also ordered to attend rehabilitation, and in 2011, it was reported that he was homeless and living in a camper van. So a sad end to the story with Sly, and I'm not sure whether that is still the case now. Just to quickly edit this bit in, Sly sued his former managers in 2010 because he didn't receive any royalties from 1989 onwards, and he won that case and was awarded $5 million. But in 2015, that case was overturned because it was found that Sly hadn't let the court know know in that previous case that he had agreed to reassign his royalties for 50% ownership of a production company and that decision was overturned. So in 2016, Sly has now appealed that decision and again, I'm assuming that the case is continuing and there's no result of it yet because that was in 2016. But looking back on this live performance, it is great to see the overall message that Sly and the Family Stone band are laying down here and trying to communicate because it is something that I think everyone in the world can learn from and it is the direction to go in that hopefully, fingers crossed, we can continue to go in in the future. But thank you guys so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at and keep those suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think and if you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock!